groups of people set up in uh, 2010 um, by three survivors of female genital mutilation. And um, our aim was to, to basically um, fill in the gaps where young girls are being missed and the girls that we want to work with are girls who are from the UK, these are British girls, because I think people have this assumption FGO only happens in Africa or out of, not, nobody will picture Europe when you think of FGO. So our vision was really to seek a world where girls are safe from um, harmful practices and we wanted to focus specifically on FGM. So if I tell you how I, um, a quick story how I got involved in the campaign, uh, nine years ago um, <clears throat> my daughter was born, I have a nine year old, and I come from a practicing community of, uh, of FGM, um, female genital mutilation, it's a practice, it's a practice where um, the total or partial removal of the genitalia uh, to a point where uh, the small labels are removed, the clitoris is totally removed, and the larger labels are also removed, and then both skin are stretched together to, uh, and it's closed with stitches, to a point where you have a small opening, at times not even a matchstick can get through, and you are expected to urinate, menstruate, you know, give birth. So you can, I think, by giving that image, you can imagine how uh, how it affects women psychologically and physically. Um, why is FGM practiced? Um, FGM is practiced for many reasons. You know, the women I work with over the years would say it was either religious, cultural, uh, it, was, it became a social norm at some point. So, um, but we uh, campaigners, I mean, one of the, the reasons, I mean, we know one of the reasons FGM is practiced is to control women's sexuality. That's what it's there for. And um, so nine years ago when um, I went to visit one of the local clinics in my area where I live in East London and um, I was asked by one of the nurses, you know, was I cut? And my response was, you know, yes I was, you know, this is, this is what we do, this is part of my culture, you know, this is, I mean, because you're brought up with that idea that it's normal. And through that question it sparked off. Um, uh, it sparked off my, in my uh, views on how I was brought up and on why I thought FGM was right. So for me, and at the time I had a young daughter, so I knew one of my challenges was going to be which route I was going to take. And through dialogue and education around FGM, and obviously it didn't take quite long, you know, before I set up a support group in my mother's living room where my friends and they will bring other friends and they were all female, where we sat down for the first time and said, you know, will you cut, will you, because no one's ever asked us that question. And these are bored British girls. And I, at the time I felt, okay, I need to make sure my daughter doesn't go through this. So to cut the story very short. So trying to protect my daughter from this practice became a nine year campaign work now, because we felt, through services, whether it was around health, education, um, um, so, uh, social, uh, social workers, there was no, there was nothing around FGM, especially when it comes to uh, protecting young girls from this practice, especially within schools. So for us, it was, um, for me at the time, it was okay, we need, I need to make sure that no other girl is in a position that I was in when I was. Uh, school uh, a child that was going to school at, um, at the time. So, sorry. <clears throat> it's really actually it's quite difficult to talk about something that is quite personal and you need, you need to come up, you need to be on the other side as a campaigner. So for me it was um, just trying to, um, I used to, uh, uh, through the survivors group, from my, from my mother's living room, then to um, luckily, a job came up for some strange reason. A job came up in that clinic where I was asked um, if I was cut as a youth outreach worker. And, and at the time when I got this job, um, I tried to locate other youth workers who were doing similar work. And I found out at the time I was the only one in whole of Europe who was doing this work. So I had to kind of build my own uh, job description, per se. And um, 
which is quite challenging because I had to put myself in that position of that young child again and see what she needed at the time. So for me, schools were the first direct group that I went to. And, and I obviously realized school teachers, head teachers were not interested. They didn't want to, they'd, actually, I remember one head teacher said to me, she did not want to upset her teachers because this, this is such a graphical um, uh, practice. And my, some, my, uh, my reaction was, but the girls in this school have gone through this and you know, you need to be in a position where you need to protect these girls. So anyway, from, we went from, <clears throat> from schools to we trained many uh, 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 professional workers within uh, um, whether they were midwives, nurses, social workers, but it's never enough. That's, I think that's really uh, a key um, issue that we, we constantly have because unfortunately, even though we have policies and laws on FGM, it's not implemented well within services. So, when we set it up also in 2000, so we wanted to look at what was what's actually missing, so what's the area that, missing, that we need to fill in, and um, we felt support was one of the key areas that we needed to look at. Um, we, um, and support uh, advocate work is really important. Young people was key in this work, and in 2000, uh, when we first set up uh, Dorsa Beam, we had the first ever youth conference in Europe uh, on FGM, and um, and one of the things that came out from that conference was that the young people saying they constantly feel dismissed by, I don't know, the communities in general, and no one takes them seriously. So for me, it was really important to highlight that their voices are very important because they are the future parents and they're the ones who are going to be making those decisions that I was faced with when my daughter was born. So for us, um, prevention is a big part of our work. We um, like I said before, we do a lot of training and for us it's really important that we also link in with other services and I think um, because we're such a small organisation now, I mean, I work from my kitchen table, so <laughs> I'll put it there. So for us to do a lot of partnership work is really important, especially um, organisations that work specifically with women and young people. Um, and these are some objectives. For, I mean, for us, it's important that we highlight. I think people usually assume uh, FGM as a cultural practice or a religious practice, but actually, FGM it's violation against ch um, children and women, and it's a form of agenda based violence because it affects one particular group. Um, just to add, um, if I quickly tell you what in what age group FGM takes place, um, it, FGM can happen from a um, few days old to puberty to childbirth to marriage and and it depends which part of the world you're from and FGM is practiced within different communities across the world uh, it's practiced with, um, with over 28 African countries um, parts of the Middle East, Yemen and in, in uh, northern Iraq and, and if you go to Asia there's in Malaysia, Indonesia um, parts of Pakistan, India, and now we're looking at Europe and <clears throat> USA because due to migration, these are young girls from these communities who are being subjected to this practice. Um, if I were to share quick uh, cases that I've uh, come across in this work, um, and actually it takes um, there's one particular woman who I've never, two women actually, I've never forgotten, and they both came into the clinic on the same day. One was a seven years old girl who uh, presented with a, I'm not a doctor, but uh, she presented with a massive cyst, so she couldn't walk. And she came in and the family was saying, you know, she had, she bumped her genitals against the chair or something, but we knew that wasn't the case. And obviously later we found that she had FGM type three, which is, total closing of the genitals. But on that same day, we had an 85-year-old woman who had exactly the same problem. So it was so it was an 80-year gap where this practice still goes on. And um, 
we meet, uh, I meet men and women who would say to me, actually the genital it doesn't belong to me, it belongs to my husband. And so you hear really all these, so for us, it's really important that we empower the women, you know, to, I mean, we have to do basic things like just educate them about their bodies. You know, many times I was faced with, uh, I would get a, a, a picture of a, a human being and say, you know, this is yours, the ear is yours, the nose is yours, so the genital is yours, it's for you to decide whatever you want to do with it and why should you be subjected to such practice. Um, in the UK we have a law, there's been a law against epidemics since 1985 and, and it said it said if you cut or performed any genital surgery on a child it was against the law. And but that was only if it happened in the UK and the act has been revived since two thousand and three. Um, and it says, obviously, if you take a child out of the country, then you can still be, you will be prosecuted for 40 year, uh, 14 years maximum of imprisonment. A few years, if you ask me, you know, was it useful to have this act? I would have said yes, but in the last few years now, I feel the act hasn't worked, and not because it's not useful. It's I think they've already we already have laws in this country that protects children, and if you're if, you, if anyone harms any parts of your body, you will be prosecuted. So I feel there is no need to have any acts around FGM. But at the same time, because this practice is a norm in communities, so the law and prevention work has to be done together because there's no point of prosecuting a mother who thinks this is a normal thing. She's doing this because she loves her child. And a few hundred people come up to me and say, you know, oh, you know, your mother did this because she loved you. My response is actually, my mother didn't know the meaning of the way she was taught about love. This is the way she was taught about love. So it's really educating people about what love is again, because my, my, I always say, you know, there's when it comes to love, you can't be hurting your child. So for me, it's again, you have to re, we have to re teach the parents. Um, and what love means. I mean, it sounds a really easy thing to do, but for certain communities, especially around such practices, it's done because that is out of love, but that's not the case. So I feel law and prevention work has to be together. And um, for me as a campaigner, it's important that I come from a place of not, where I'm not judging, because I think with certain uh, practices, people tend to go underground if you're constantly judging. So for me it's important that if you ever come across or work with uh, uh, communities where FGM is practiced, um, it's important that you have an understanding of what the practice is and why it's being practiced. And um, even for me who's from the community, it's quite difficult at times to watch an audience when I'm describing what FGM is and saying this is normal. Just, just see people's faces, it's like, okay, you know, this is quite, it is shocking and it's horrific. However, when you are trying to do this work, you have to really try to understand what it is. But at the same time, you have to choose to protect that child and to support that woman who's gone through this practice. I mean, the message I really would like to, uh, my key message today is, and I always say this, it's um, um, saving one girl, it's key. Because you save one girl, you break that cycle. And the reason I know that works, because I did that with me, with me and my family. So for me, uh, my grandmother had it done, my mother had it done, I had it done, my sister had it done. But making sure my daughter's not cut has been one of the biggest achievements of my life. And that is where that cycle is broken. But at the same time, if you're in a community where you're constantly told, you know, you're a female, this is what you do, this is what you're supposed to be doing. So for me, as a mother of a nine-year-old girl, it's just come to remind her, yes, we still live in a world where we're still not equal, but, but you, have to take ownership of who you are and no one can tell you what to do or be who, who you need to be. So you don't have to fit into these criteria you were given as a woman. 
so for me that's really uh, a key uh, point because I think people can feel so um, disarmed after hearing about FGM, you know, what can I do? But I think, I mean, there's quite a few of us in this room, if, what, if all of us focused on one girl they could save, we'd be saving quite a few generations just within this room. So for me, I would like to say, you know, please do not be disheartened. And the way you can help is by talking about it with your families, within your, you know, work uh, colleagues or whatever <coughs> groups you belong to, because this is an issue not just in Africa, this is a European issue. These are British girls and British girls, every British child has the right to be protected. And sadly, in the UK, we have 24,000 girls every year who are at risk of FGM. And I think ignoring those girls is actually a crime. And um, so just to uh, sum up what I'm saying is, um, um, policymakers have the responsibility to make sure these girls are safe. So hopefully after today, you will have a different frame of mind of uh, when it comes to looking at child protection policies and uh, in place. So, so you can be, hopefully you'll be more informed, but to get more information about uh, um, our work with all to be, we're on Facebook. Social networking is the best thing, I'm not gonna lie. So I was quite disappointed when I was told I could tweet. <laughs> and, but it has been a, a great tool for us to reach many young people. I mean, I, have, uh, I, have to, I organize uh, reversal operations for women through Facebook, you know, so they can contact us. So I could be the one contacting the hospital, making sure, I don't, I don't have to know who they are. So that is really, really important for us when we do this kind of work, because we're still, it's still an underground issue. So we need to bring it up to the forefront. I mean, the only obstacle uh, I have when it, to be in this position, you know, you, I get told I betrayed my community, um, especially when you're uh, a single parent, you know, I'm having a divorce, by the way. So for me to be in that position, when you're trying to challenge an issue that it's uh, done for men, so I'm a woman who's challenging, uh, um, sorry, um, so for me to be in that position, you do get threatened all the time. Um, my daughter was threatened a few times, I had to move home a few times. But the reason I've never stepped away from this campaign is because I want to share my experience with others and, <coughs> and it, there is hope out there. So I think the more people always tell me I can't do it, actually, I like take, I took it, I'll take it to another level, so I'm like appearing on TED is at another level of, of, of doing this kind of work. And a few times I have written resignation letters because you, you do get to a point where, I mean, you're a human being, there's limits that you have to how much people could, I mean, people spit at you in the middle of the street, um, people wrote, web, uh, people dedicated websites to me, which, you know, I took it as a compliment, but, <laughs> but really people do that. So. Please do not be disheartened. So there is hope there. So my daughter's now not cut. When she was seven, I was cut when I was seven years old. So on her seventh birthday, we had a great party celebrating that she is a beautiful child who doesn't need to be harmed to be part of the society.